all of us at some point felt insecure, unattractive, not smart, not talented, something what held us down that would hold us back from going after or achieving. Jane Curran, welcome to Women of Impact. Thank you for having me. I love coming. I, this is my third time on the show. Dude, I freaking love hanging with you. And every time I learn something new about you, and where I want to start today is when I met you, I'd heard about all the freaking success, the business success, like, you know, your, your marriage, your podcast, like everything you freaking do isn't just mediocre, it's fucking next level. And so I think of you as being extremely resilient, extremely confident, no bullshit, like doesn't hide behind anything. And then you share a story after all your successes, after being the freaking badass that you are here today. You share a story that the person that you wanted on your podcast the most, Mark freaking Wahlberg, you're confident, you're badass. He then is sitting next to you one day and you like, literally bulk in asking him to come on your podcast. And so the power here right now is knowing that you can have the confidence and the, the strength to go after one thing at one moment in your life and yet feel not confident even when you've put in the reps and not show up confident in other areas of your life. And what I find so damn powerful is even someone as successful as you can do that. And so what I love is that you've written a book about what principles you can literally implement in your life, no matter what successes, no matter what freaking failures you've had, that you can live by these principles so that you can keep showing up. Wow. What? A, yes. I, I, I don't even know what to say. That's like amazing the way you just said that. And I think what you said is very true, which is I think confidence is also something that's a muscle that you have to work every single day. People can ebb and flow in confidence. And that Mark Wahlberg story is something that was a time when I didn't have the confidence to actually do it because I just... I, I just got nervous and that's what happens. We all have self-doubt and sometimes you have more self-doubt than other times. And in that moment, it's one of the things that I always call to and I, that's why I kick myself because one of my big philosophies in life is that rejection is always better than regret. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, I was really upset because now, and even, even though that happened over a year and a half ago, that regret of like, what if, what if, you know, like if I would have asked, what's the worst? I mean, you and I always talk about this. What's the worst thing that can happen? The worst thing is someone says no. The worst thing is that it, it doesn't work out. But how are you any worse off than you were two seconds before that happened? Mm -hmm. Right. So there's enough rejection in the world. Don't self reject. And I self rejected myself in that moment. And we all do it. And that's why like, I, I stand by that whole regret is so much worse than the rejection for that reason. And that example is just proof right there. And like I said, it happens all the time. And that is why I believe that we have to constantly work the, the muscle of boldness and audacity, really, you know? I love that so much. So take me to that moment then, because the regret is worse than rejection. Principle freaking number one, people write that down right now. So in that moment where you were fearing the rejection and now you have the regret, you obviously can stand true to that statement. So next time, how would you approach it differently? So Mark Wahlberg is now sitting next to you again. You remind yourself of this principle. How do you act differently? I think, you, I think there's a couple things. You remember that feeling and emotion. And the Mark Wahlberg, just to kind of give people some yeah. kind of context, right? Like, Lisa, you know, we're talking about, I really wanted Mark Wahlberg to be on my podcast because he was, you know, you make a list of like your, the, the, your wish list mm -hmm. of guests to have on your podcast. I have a wish list. He was on, he was like number one or number two because he standed for a lot of the things that I stand for. And he is like, my podcast is called Habits and Hustle. And he is literally habits and hustle. He wakes up at 2.30 in the morning to work out. He's grinded and has more grit and hustle than so many, like he's created himself into something that, you know, he came from the projects basically and was like, like was, was basically a criminal, a hoodlum, right? And then he became a top entrepreneur, a top movie star, has, has his hands in tons of stuff. And he really epitomized what I believe in, which is 
in my, my thing is you don't find yourself, you create yourself. And he created himself. And because of that, he was so important for me to have on the show. And I, when I saw him sitting beside me at dinner randomly, I mean, not even as far as you and I are sitting, and I could not get the guts to go up to him, it was unbelievable. So that's the story. That's like the, the, the context of it, right? Now, when you're in that moment, and when, I, and I've, and when I've been in that moment even pro and since then, I remember that feeling of that, like, that, like, that gut-wrenching feeling of what if. Afterwards. Afterwards, mm -hmm. which, which carries me. You know, I then go maybe two months later to an event and Mark Cuban just so happened to be at that event. And I remember that feeling I felt. Now, I felt that same way when I, Mark Cuban was also on my list. He was maybe like, they were like neck to neck, right? And I was like, you know what? This is my moment. Again, I don't want the same thing to happen to me that happened with, with Mark Wahlberg. And I, at, at first, cowered. And then I remember that emotional feeling. And I'm like, you know what? That rejection is better than regret. So I literally just didn't overthink it because that's how you get stuck, mm -hmm. right? When you overthink something, you then become, you can become like analysis paralysis. Like you don't want to, you, know, you don't do anything. You get, you get stopped in that track. I wouldn't overthink it. I barged right up to him and I said to him, I have this podcast, da, 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 da. And by the way, I should tell you, I've asked him, I've emailed him, I've called him four or five times before then and heard nothing. Mm -hmm. So this was my opportunity. And I, I basically said all this. And he Can you say what the da 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 is? Because this is this is what I want to hammer home. It's not just going up to someone. It's the words you use. It's the words you because use. Because if you went up to if you went up to him and you're like, oh my god, Mark, come on my show, he may go, who are you? So I actually want to dig deep on what you said because that obviously has that knock-on effect. Absolutely. So. I already had, I did my homework a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Because I've already approached him multiple times mm -hmm. through email, through other people who knew other people who knew other people. And so I knew what his projects were. I knew what he was, what he stood for, what he's about. So I did not just run up to him and be like, oh my God, I'm a huge fan. I love you. That was not how I did it. I knew that recently he started a healthcare company, which was to be to kind of take away the middleman of of what like pharma is about. So you can and he was really passionate about this project. So I use that as the tagline. I'm like, hello, I I have a podcast. I've approached you numerous times. You probably don't know. I know you have this healthcare program that you are really trying to get out to the world. I would love to support you in any way I can. And that was how I introduced myself. And he was like, I do have the, you know, I do have this program. What do you think of it? And I'm like, I think it's great because when you're using, you know, a lot of people can't afford the drugs. There's a lot of problems with healthcare. Everybody knows that. And with his new company, you can save a lot of money by eliminating that, that middleman. And I said, I love it because, you know, I'm, I, you know, everyone seems to have a problem with healthcare. And I was able to speak intelligently about what he was, what he was doing. Mm. And he's like, you know what, I, I'll come on your podcast. We can, we can talk about it further. And it was like, I was like, yes. And it was like a big, yeah. big win. Right. But I think it's a combination of not overthinking, realizing that feeling when you didn't do something. And so therefore you're, you're living in this what if moment. And then doing your homework. I, I'm a big believer in ownership, taking ownership of the destiny of your destiny, right? A lot of times we just acquiesce to what's in front of us. We take what's good enough as opposed to chasing what we really want. So then therefore we don't live the life we want. We just kind of live in this good enough phase. So you need to take ownership and make make things happen for yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of opportunity out there if your eyes are, are open wide enough to see them. I don't believe in luck. I believe in hard work. I believe in like taking your shot 
and going after those things. Dude, I love this so freaking much. So with the Mark Cuban story, I didn't actually know any of that story, but I knew that you had him on because, you know, we're friends and I saw right. you have him on. So I, I knew how it ended. I didn't know the story. So why that so damn powerful? I mean, so many reasons. So A, the assessment of you did something in the past that didn't serve the goal that you're trying to get to. You didn't go up to Mark Wahlberg, but you didn't just leave it there. You didn't just lick your wounds and go, oh my God, well, that makes me a bad person. You know, you went, oh shit next time I need to make sure that I don't let this happen again so you learn from your mistakes or your um, the way of showing up you learn what that got you so you realize not going up to him means I don't have him on my show okay that didn't work didn't settle for you right so then the next step is then when you get the opportunity do you know do you have you done your homework are you going are you going out with your hand out say hey I want this from you or are you approaching them and like this is what is important to you and I know this and this is how I can bring you value Absolutely. So this is a, that's a big point, right? Because I think when people think about being bold or um, asking for what you want, right? It, it has this, like, it has this connotation of being very aggressive or being very me oriented. Mm. And the truth of the matter Mm. is I never lead with that. And I don't think people should lead with that. I think people misunderstand what being bold is and, and going after what you want And if they can think of it in a reframe, which is how can I better serve you? How can I support you? But the problem is most people don't think that they have any, any value to any, like to people who they perceive as better than them or more successful than them. So they count themselves out before they even try. And the truth is I reframe that to believe like I do have value and I could be valuable. It's about being a little creative to figure out how you can serve and how you can show up for someone else. Like the Mark Cuban is a great example. You know, like he started this, like I said, this healthcare company and he needed to get it out to a lot of different people. Yeah, I'm a small cog in the wheel, but I'm still a cog, Mm -hmm. right? I'm still, I'm still like something. So like, even if it's to 20 people, what's those 20 people are going to maybe tell another 20 people. And so you can't be so myopic in your way of thinking. You've got to expand that, that thought process and realize that everybody has a value and everyone brings value. And you don't, don't, you don't need to count yourself out. Or like I said earlier, self-reject because it's plenty of that out there. Mm-hmm. You need to be the, the hero, as you say, of your own world and your own life and put yourself in these circumstances and think of yourself differently. Mm-hmm. And that is literally how I've lived my life. It's so amazing. And I've also heard you say, which is kind of like one of my favorite phrases, right? If you don't ask, the answer will always be no. Always. Like that is so strong because in these moments where we're talking about goals, how do we live the life that we want? How do we really go out and crush life, have that life? When I think about you even just setting, okay, so I want Mark Cuban. That's step number one. Like voice the goal that you want. And you've said it before and you really repeat this in the book. And I want to make sure that we really freaking hammer this home is how many of us settle? How many of us say, well, it's good enough. And to your point is you the very like one of the principles is you cannot settle you cannot look at life and just say well this is good enough and so if we just start there and say all right the life that i have isn't good enough what life do i want and this can be relationships this can right like how many people settle in relationships that just say oh well it's fine like oh how's your relationship it's fine you know but people have settled same with careers oh well it's fine same with our life it's fine like that becomes the the word that we use so to you, what I love where you start with the book is really hammering home. You just have to admit, you have to acknowledge that your life isn't good enough. That's 100% true. And I, I believe that to be wholeheartedly the truth. We have to take a strong, real look at ourselves and have some self-awareness and figure out and say to ourselves, you know, are we really living the life we want? Are we being authentic? Are we self-actualized? It's really mm-hmm. what it is. Are we self-actualizing to who we want to be? And if you can take that honest look at that, you will usually see some blind spots. Sometimes you could be self-actualizing and be really happy in some areas and maybe feel like in other areas, it's not. Or, or, and sometimes it's like a, clean, a, a slate, a clean slate cr- across the board where you're just living in this like place of good enough. And I wanna be very clear. And I talk about living a rich life. And I'm not talking living a rich life in with money and jewels and cars and boats. 
but I'm talking about a, a rich life that has meaningful relationships and a meaningful career, a life of experiences, and a life that when you were a little girl or a little boy and you saw yourself, are you living that life that you wanted when you were young? Because when we are young, we have these, we have visions of what we want to do and who we want to become. But then life kind of tears you down and you have a bad experience and you fall and, you know, then something else knocks you down. And then like slowly we chip away and say, okay, you know what? That didn't work out. Well, this is good enough. And then something else happens and you're like, you lose a little more of that, you know, self-confidence and, you know, you're like, okay, well, that didn't work. So that's fine. And then eventually we're living this, this life that we don't even recognize in a person we don't even recognize. Mm -hmm. And then we live this, we like live these slow deaths that is so sad. And it, to me, it's like, you only are here for a short period of time. You know, you have the power within you to create whatever you want out of yourself. You don't have to be the most talented. You don't have to be the smartest person. You just have to have an idea and you need to have a desire. And then you have to pick a direction, not even a destination, just a direction. And then start moving along that direction because life is really about momentum, right? Something in motion stays in motion. Mm. When we're stuck and you stay still, nothing happens. And that's why people who have jobs are the ones who usually get other job offers, right? Or the people in relationships are the ones who actually meet other people, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're out there, they're, they're like, they're doing, they're involved, they're in, they're in the mix. You got to put yourself in the mix and you have to be like, what I talk about a lot is this 10% target, which is, you know, pick one thing that you want most. I mean, like, like laser it down to one thing that you want to go after. And then make 10 attempts at it. And you may not even get that goal at the end of those 10 attempts. But what you learn through the process is that idea of that being comfortable with like failing and asking and going and doing in those 10 attempts. So to me, the 10 attempts is having something. And a lot of times you don't even get that goal, but another opportunity presents itself that you never even knew existed by just going through the exercise of doing it. Dude, I fucking love this. And like I, I even said to you before we started rolling, what I really love about your book is you put these principles in place. They um, they have words and like titles that are very easy for me to remember um, in moments that I need them. So the one principle that you just mentioned that I want to make sure that people really write down and emphasize is the 10% target. Because in these moments where you've gone out and done something, right? Like you're really scared you have a, a paralysis um, analysis, analysis paralysis. thank you you have analysis paralysis you stay where you are and then okay I'm just gonna be bold like Jen told me I'm gonna be bold I'm gonna be bold you go and do something bold and it fails now in that moment of maybe the failure or the ding to your ego or something like that some people may then stop so in this moment of saying the 10% target do it 10 times now go it's beautiful because now the first time I try I'm not expecting that one time to be a score to be the best. Right. I just go, oh, I've given myself 10 times. The fifth time failed, great. Now I'm <laughs> on to the sixth. But if you don't start there, you can, by the second or third time, tell yourself, I'm a failure. Easily. Easily. And so I love this 10% target idea that you have. Um, how do we start to, after the five, the sixth time, even if we know we need to get to the 10th, how do we self-soothe ourselves so that we can get up? that we can try that seventh and that eighth? Well, I think because you're doing something, like, again, I think as you keep on asking the question or doing the attempt, and there's lots of different ways. It's it gonna be an email, it could be going mm -hmm. up to somebody, it's to be asking someone else if they know somebody, using the people, what I call your your bold of directors, your the people that you surround yourself with, right? I call them the bold your bold of directors, that. right? Your support system which is also very important, right? Because those are the people who are going to encourage you and support you and help you get to your goal, mm -hmm. right? I think that's a piece that we, we haven't touched on yet, which I think is extremely important 
because we are the sum of the people that we are around the most. And if you're around people who are negative, who are toxic, who don't want the best for you, then you become you kind of you become that person or you you become self-defeating because of that reason. Mm -hmm. But if you create this bold of directors around you of these people who are supporting of you and they want you to succeed and they want to help you, that helps your chances. So use those people as some of your attempts to get to that goal. And like I was saying earlier, those attempts are not it's a, it's a great practice even if like that goal is, is something that you don't achieve. But the practice that you get from those attempts mm. make it easier and easier to do the next attempt and the next attempt. And the way someone gets more comfortable with asking for a really big thing is getting comfortable by asking for a little thing. And that's what I tell people in my book is that if you have a big ask or a big goal, why don't you start with something small that you can kind of just get, get comfortable Something small, like I say, do a little bold move every day. And that could be as simple as, you know, calling yourself like your cell phone provider and figuring out what other plans they have, to, you know, that they can offer you that, you know, that you can maybe save some money on. Something that you wouldn't do because you just accept the fact that you've been using this one plan for two years, three years, and you're paying the same amount every single month. But I bet you, if you made that phone call, there's somewhere where you can save a little money mm -hmm. if you just ask the question. And nine out of 10 times, there is. Mm -hmm. So that's a simple thing. Or when you go to a restaurant, I talk about this, you know, I think you know this already. I can be considered a big pain in the butt because I want this on the side, I wanna hold this. I use the menu as just like a place where I know the ingredients that are on, that they, that they have in the building. You know, like it's not something that like, okay, so I know that they have chicken. I know they have some spinach. I see it on the different items that they have. They have some, you know, they have some pasta, whatever it is. And I just mix and match. I love, sorry, I'm <laughs> laughing and I am, don't mean to interrupt. I actually no, do you mean do to interrupt. interrupt. Yeah. yeah, because this is so amazing. And the reason is, you know me, you know the Karate Kid, right? Yes, wax on, yes. wax off. I'm always thinking, how do I like paint the fence or wax the car so that when I do finally get in the ring, I'm actually prepared? These are the moments, girl, where it's like so many people would never think to ask yeah. a waiter to order something that isn't directly as a main meal on the menu and to imagine what you're saying right now where it's like everyone at home, the next time you go for dinner, I actually just want someone to try it because to your point, the small things, like really do stack. So yeah. if someone right they now is embarrassed, thing. yeah. But you have like almost zero shame over doing zero this, shame. which I fucking love. Because you know, I have zero shame in general. That's, that's, let us be honest. But that's because it, I've been practicing it for so long. Right. That's become my new normal. I don't know any different. Right. Like even when I go out, go out with people that are new, right? I try really hard to kind of like, just kind of like temper it a little bit. But I can't because it's not who I am anymore. Mm. So the neuroplasticity has changed in my brain so much <laughs> that like I can't recognize that old person. <gasps> and, cool. the, and the reality is, if you really think about it, if you're too nervous to speak up when someone disrespects you, if you're too embarrassed to ask for that promotion when you know you deserve it, if you want the confidence to go and ask that person for their phone number or the confidence to walk away from a bad relationship, no matter what you want confidence to do, it all starts with taking courageous action. That's why I created the 10 things confident badasses do to stay confident PDF, which you can download immediately by clicking the link in the description below. By taking these 10 steps together, you'll be able to say the things that you were too nervous to say and do the things that you were hesitant to do so that you can become the woman you've always known you can become. So guys, go grab your copy right now by clicking the link in the description below. Now, back to the episode. It's not what you say, it's yeah. how you say it. Yeah. So if you're asking some, someone of something but you're kind about it and you're nice about it and you're not an asshole. People are, are almost always obliged to like want to help you. You know what I mean? And like there's been lots of times when I've been at restaurants with people and I have like, you know, tweaking this and changing that. And the person I'm with is so mortified. They're like, oh my God, I can't believe you're doing it. And then I get my meal and they get their meal and I'm, you know, happier than a pig in shit. 
and they're miserable with their meal. And they're like, I wish I, I did that, mm. but they don't have, they didn't have the courage. So like the point, and then when we go out again, they're like, I'll have what she's having, right? Because they want to be able to do it on their own, but they haven't worked up the, the, the guts or the courage so far. So you do little things like, I'm not saying like you can you, the first time out change the entire menu, but why don't you just ask for the sauce on the side? Or if, if your meal comes and it's cold, how, like, why don't you send it back? Like to me, these are like small little things, but you're at least standing for what you know you want out of life. You're not just taking whatever someone just throws in front of you. Dude, that's like one of the most powerful like statements that you make is that we need to start asking for what we actually want instead of accepting what we're given. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's so strong. And to me, it's like, it, it's, it's like you're taking something that's super simple and you, people want to complicate it, but it's really not that complicated. It's about, again, like just taking agency and being your, you know, being the CEO of your life, like saying, I don't, I don't really want that, or that's not really good enough, or, you know, that doesn't serve me well. Mm. And stepping in and saying, you know what, I'd like to have it a little bit differently, or, you know, like, that's not like the, that's not the person I want to go out with. You know, we were saying this a little bit earlier that, you know, and there's been a lot of research backing this. And there's been like, I talk about a lot of, of research in here, but there's a whole thing about how a big percentage of people, you know, end up marrying the person that just asks them out because they ask them out as opposed to saying, you know, I'm look. I really want somebody who is this and this and that and that and this and that. And instead of you asking that person out because it's like society condemns that, like, oh wow, you're too aggressive and it's not, you know, that's not very ladylike or that's not this or not that or I'm shy or I'm nervous or I'm not good enough. I don't have the courage. You just end up going out with whoever asked you out or whoever swiped on you or whatever the normal, mm. like the terminology is now. And to me, that's a really sad existence, right? Because you didn't even give yourself a shot to live that life. You counted yourself out before even putting yourself in the game. And to me, it's like, why? You know, you, you have, you know, you, there, you have to sit there and think about all the good things that you have to offer. And like everyone has strengths and everyone has weaknesses and think of all your strengths and then use that power to go after that person you want. It's not about just getting the job you want. It's about getting the person you want to be with and surrounding yourself with people you want to be with and doing the things you want to be doing. That's what a rich life is. Dude, I, f I absolutely love that. And it started to make me think about as we're talking, okay, there's definitely like the recognition, right? The acknowledgement of, are you actually living the life you want? Have you settled? Where have you settled? And then how do you pivot? That's really like the strong, you know, uh, yeah. things that we're discussing here. And when it comes to relationships, it is more complicated because when it's like your life, Right. In mm -hmm. the sense of like, I'm, you know, an attorney and I freaking hate being an attorney. And so I sit here and I happen to come across this interview and I'm like, oh, my God, I totally settled with being an attorney because my whole family wanted me to be an attorney. What life do I want? Right. And we're going to give them the skill sets and the principles for them to be able to do that. But there's also the other side of relationships where maybe you're in a relationship and maybe you've settled over time of how they are. Right. Oh, well, it's just them. Oh, well, I know that bothers me, but it's just them. Right. And we've just settled it's actually trickier, right, to start implementing these principles because there's no like, unless of course you've decided that you need to break up with this partner, there's an evolution within that relationship. And so now being bold, not to be bold to be like, I'm leaving, but bold to say, hey, I love you, we've been together for a long time, but right now actually, I've settled for X, Y, and Z where you're really messy or that you dismiss me when we're at dinner or whatever it is. And it's like, I've really accepted this. And right now in this new way that I want to show up, it actually doesn't sit well with me anymore. And I'd love to discuss how we can change it, right? That's freaking bold to be able to have the audacity or the guts, the confidence to speak up and tell your partner that you want to make this change. And so when it comes to being bold, I think it's super powerful to distinguish between the types of bold and then the different areas where you can be bold. And the thing that you talk about in the book that I was like, oh, this is really beautifully explained is the difference between risk and being bold. And I think that we conflate those two and put them in one bucket. It's like, I'm not going to say anything because there's too much risk. 
Yeah, there, there's a first of all, there's a big difference between. That's why I I don't want to I don't want to come across flippant like just be bold and like just no. you know like ruin your life. No, like I think there's some kind of like there is a difference. And what you were saying is so so on point, and which is that it's not about just like blowing up your relationship because a lot of times you you can have the good bo- you have good bones in that mm. foundation, but people go one direction and other people go another direction and then you lose you lose each other and lose yourself. But what I'm talking about in the boldness or taking ownership is kind of confronting that and doing something about it and not just saying, well, okay, this is what it is and like living your life like that. It's about being bold enough to speak what your truth is, to speak what's important to you and and to say this is what's happening and put Act, put things in action or put things in a plan where you can kind of counter those things, mm-hmm. right? So it's not like like you're saying, yeah, well, you know, we just like we'll blow apart and we're, we're going to get a divorce and this will be it. At least put effort into it. It's all about the effort. Mm-hmm. I'm a, like I guess I'm a big believer in like that ownership agency and and work. You put work into it. You and Tom have a great relationship because you guys work on it. People become successful in things that they focus on. A lot of times we don't focus on those things, so then they just die on the vine. It's about not letting those things die in the vine. And to, to that point is that if you are with somebody and you have kids with somebody, it becomes even more difficult. So you're gonna have to put in those hours and work at plan so those things can kind of work themselves out. But at least you're gonna put the effort in and you put you put a plan in and you and you speak up and you try to make it better it's it's not just leaving something and completely pivoting if you're an attorney for per in your job you don't like that if you if you're an attorney obviously you have a lot of transferable skills that could be used just doing something else but it's like taking that moment and sitting down and being, what am I good at? Obviously, if you can be an attorney and you can go to school and you can learn and you know the law and you have this, there's other things that that can par- be parlayed into. Mm-hmm. But it's about, again, looking at options and seeing your life as a, a, and, your, and, and, the, and things around you as opportunity, not as, as something that you have only this myopic way of living. There's a lot of things like my, in my success and in my life, it's about taking these dots, like I, I can, like things that were actually a failure ended up being very successful because it was just a dot that connected to another dot somewhere mm. else. But you don't know how those things end. You know, if you're on chapter one, you don't know how chapter 10 ends. So you have to at least put the effort in and take that moment to, to see where what you've done in the past as those transferable skills or what that failure has done, where that can kind of lead to something that could be very successful for you down the road. Dude, that's so freaking fire. And you've been like the perfect example of how all of those dots really do link. Um, and so uh, if when people are listening right now, I think that we've done a really good job of like really exposing like how you can identify when you need to make that pivot in your life. Um, and then getting started, I've heard you say, just pick a start date. And I'd really love to talk to you about this because I've heard conflicting um, sides and I'm kind of on the fence about it can be super freaking powerful to pick a date. Right? Just freaking pick a date. On this day, I'm going to start um, being bold towards the life that I want. But also, I've also heard that sometimes picking a date can actually set you up for disaster because now it feels like it's um, it's very finite. Like I'm going to start on this date, and then before that, it's kind of like dieting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was right? going to where, say that it's like dieting. Where like, people are just like, I'm going to start January first, but for the three weeks leading up to it, I may as well consume every ounce of sugar I possibly can. And so. By picking a start date, you've actually set yourself back right before that. Yeah, so I agree with you. There's a lot of like people who think different things. I, but to me, it's like if I want to lose five pounds, right? Why would, would I allow myself another three weeks of being behind the eight ball, right? When I can start today. Like to me, what, what's the power of, of, of waiting? I think when you have a, a date in place, in, in plan, which is soon, you, it gives you some momentum. Like I'm a big momentum person. I don't love this idea of like just staying still in, 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 in purgatory. Mm-hmm. To me, purgatory is the worst place to be. And I said it before, I'm going to keep on saying it. It's all about the momentum. Even if you start small, at least you're starting. I think also it changes how you perceive. Like to me, 
the best way to gain motivation and confidence is to have a small win. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the more that you don't do that, the more you're setting yourself back further and further. I, I just think that we are our own worst enemies. And what we always end up doing is we, we just, we end up thinking of all the reasons why we can't do something. We're not smart enough. We're not talented enough. When I was a little girl, I hated my nose. I think you and I had this in yeah, common, right? Yeah, we do. I still hate my nose, but still. I feel like a lot of times we, we have something that really holds us back and we feel because of that thing, we're not going to be able to get to another thing, right? And I put this thing together that's called fix it, forget it, or farm it out. And what this is, is that you, if, if something is really holding you back from starting, you can put things in three different buckets, which is if you, if you fix it, then make, make, if you decide to fix it, then do that and kind of get that thing on the roll. If you are not going to do anything about it, just forget about it and let, and, and keep on moving. And if you're bad at something, but you, you need it, get someone else to help you along with the plan. So I don't like, like I said, this idea of just like standing still and just waiting. There's ways you can counter, mm. counter anything. If you don't like something. So with my nose, I decided not to fix it. I couldn't farm that out. <laughs> and so I had to just forget about it. And I kept on going. And the reality is like, it didn't really slow me down that much. Right? So it's all about like figuring out how you could take agency, take ownership and get from point A to point B to point C without letting things about you or things you don't like or things you're bad at hold you down and stop you from being the best version of yourself mm -hmm. and being the best badass that you can be. I, I love the three Fs. I love it. Like, because again, it gives me tactics because sometimes I can get in my own head. Lisa, you're not good enough. What are you doing? Right. Who do you think you are going after that person? <laughs> you know, whatever it is. Um, and so going to your point, if you're, if momentum is everything and procrastination is the opposite and it literally does like actually hold you back, then what do I do when I'm procrastinating? Great. Now it gives me a plan of going, okay, what is the thing you're procrastinating? What is the thing that you're afraid of moving forward or whatever? And now put it in a bucket. Dude, it's so damn powerful. I love it. And it's cute that you used your nose as an example, yeah. by the way. Um, I'm just using it as an example because it's, it's like something small and silly that uh, to someone else, but to me, it was like a big reason why I didn't want to do certain things when I was small. I got made fun of because of my nose. So stupid. But then it must say, oh, I'm ugly. I'm not good enough. I don't look the right way. Da, da, da. And it's something that like brings you down a stupid rabbit hole. And why I bring up the nose is because all of us at some point felt insecure, unattractive, not smart, not talented, something what held us down that would hold us back from going after or achieving. And so I use that because I think everyone can relate to something mm. like that. You know, like not everybody is a supermodel, right? And by the way, being mediocre and being average is your biggest superpower because you have to learn how to be resourceful and have grit and build character in other ways. And for me, when I was just like an at, like being average was like, amazing for me because I had no other choice because I couldn't rest on my laurels. And I think everybody can at some point, maybe 1% of the population cannot relate, but 99% of the people listening to this would be like, yeah, you know what? That's me. And I think it's a really important, powerful message because it's not the smartest that wins. It's not the most talented that wins. It's the person that kind of can take all that compartmentalize that, reframe it in their brain, take those negative thoughts and turn them into a positive, figure out a bucket to put it in and still go after it. Oh my God, I love this. And when I read your chapter, me, me, uh, mediocrity is a superpower. I was like, all right, I don't know where she's going with it, so I have to fucking read it because of course you're using like the superpower, my, you know, my language that I love. And so when I started to read it, I was like, oh, this is my superpower because I honestly think of myself as average. And you even said, I can't believe Lisa, you've read my book. Most people don't, right? Well, before we started rolling. And I was like, so true. A, of course, I'm going to show you the respect. And then B, it is because I'm average that I need to read your book so that I can show up today as a host and fucking crush it. It is because I'm average that I don't believe in myself that I preach, have preach, to preach. go and get all the knowledge I possibly can. And you even said it earlier about Mark Cuban, right? It's like, you did your research. 
Do the damn homework. Anytime you're walking into a room, right, if you don't know something, go freaking figure it out. In today's society where you've got Professor Google, there's no damn excuse on not knowing something. So now it's, did you do the work? Did you do the work? I had to very, you know, specifically, I knew you were going to come on. I knew you had to book. I had to clear my schedule. I had to carve out at least eight hours. I then sat with your book and read your book. That has to be very deliberate. That has to be very calculated, very planned. And the reason why I did all that is going back to your, your beautiful point of that it was all because I'm average. And I knew in order to show up like a freaking beast and like a badass host, I had to put in the, the reps. Ab. So, oh my God, absolutely. And that is exactly what I had to do my entire mm. life. And that is, and to me, I'll, you know, work ethic beats talent, beats mm -hmm. looks, beats everything. Because beats smarts, it is honestly the world favors the bold, not the brilliant. And that is 100% accurate. Because of I, what you just said to me is exactly why I do what I do. I read everybody's book before they come on my show. I over-prepare. I go out. I, I, I really had to kind of figure out other ways to succeed in life because I could not rest on those laurels. Mm -hmm. And to me, the people that you see out there who are the most successful, crushing life in everything, it's our, it, it is that person. A lot of times, you know, when you're too good, too smart, too pretty, too this or too that, you end up like kind of just like phoning it in everywhere because you never had to figure out, figure it out. You never had to work hard. You never had to do that extra stuff that you had to, to, to build character, to build grit, to build resilience. You have to have resilience to be able to fall and get right back up and try again. And when you're average or mediocre, it's those people that have to learn those lessons at an early age. And that would, that's what makes them shine later. You know, I look back at these people that were like the superstars when I was in high school or junior high or elementary, and they're like doing not much with their lives. They're not really, you know, they're not, there's, there are no great shakes about them. But all the people that were made fun of mm -hmm. or that had it hard or who were considered like not cool or not popular, they are like out there in crushing life because they had to figure it out. I think there is a real disservice actually with people who had it too easy for them. Mm -hmm. And the people who had to struggle and had to be resourceful and were not the greatest students and were not the best, you know, athletes, they were the ones that had to kind of figure out how to become like, who, how to become like a full person in life. And that's someone's best asset. God, it's so damn true. And there's so many factors that, that factor into how we show up. Like for instance, I think there's some weird stat that it's like, if you're one of the oldest in your year, because mm. um, you were born like early September and you're an athlete, you're actually more likely to be more successful to go on to play in the NBA yep. or the NFL. That's the Outliers book. Because, oh, is that it? Yeah. I can't remember where I heard it, but I think it's because you're just above enough everybody else that you're given the confidence that you're fucking amazing. And so what you do is you keep working, you're like, you keep going, everyone's like, oh my God, you're so amazing, we're gonna put you in this class. And then you keep showing up because you haven't actually felt behind the eight ball. But to your point, there are also people that are just behind the eight ball that actually succeed more than them because they've had that tiny bit of friction that the people who are ahead of the eight ball haven't had. Absolutely, I, I, I agree 100%. Uh, have you heard of the Batman effect? Yes. And so I love that you brought that out because, of course, that's the next thing as we're talking about yeah. how there's a difference between knowing it, right? So everything that we've just said, it's very um, surface intellectual. It's know that you can do it, know that when you fail, you can get back up. There's a very different side when you actually have to do it, when you're facing that voice in your head that's telling you're no good. In those moments, even though you know it, it's hard to show up. And so I'd love to talk about the Batman effect because these are beautiful tools that people can use in those moments where they're telling themselves they can do it, but they don't feel like they can. And it's so true, right? Because and I'll, I'll, I'll just give a little bit about it, is that when, you know, when you were a little kid and you would wear a Batman cape or a Wonder Woman cape or a Wonder Woman necklace, right? And it was kind of becoming your alter ego, right? It, it kind of gives you, and there's like a lot of backing and research about this. It's called the Batman effect because 
they, there, was, there was something that was a research project with a lot of researchers studied children between the ages of four and six years old. And what they did was um, they gave them a, 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 like a piece of work to do, like something to, to accomplish. And what they noticed was that the kids that had this alter ego of, you know, wearing a Batman cape or thinking of themselves as Wonder Woman, right? Their focus and perseverance to that task t- was went mm-hmm. tenfold, right? And that's why Beyonce goes on stage and she's Sasha Fierce, right? It's this alter ego effect, this Batman effect. And when you feel that way, when you feel that you can't or you're not good enough or that you don't have that confidence, there's a lot of backing research about that fact of like when you have this alter ego that you could kind of take yourself out of the picture and into a third person, the perseverance just becomes that much more. And that's also called self-distancing, which is, a, you know, more of a psychological term. But, I prefer the Batman effect. Yeah, the Batman <laughs> effect works for me or the Wonder Woman the Wonder effect, Woman right? Effect, yeah. and, uh, and then, of course, you can relate. And that's why I wear my Wonder Woman necklace and you wear your Wonder Woman necklace, which, by the way, you started me on this whole thing, which is in the book, the whole story. It's so and, sweet that you mentioned it. Well, this is the truth, you know. Can I share it right yeah, now? Please, okay. Yeah, please, yeah. So, Lisa came on my podcast. Uh, well, this was like the first time the I first ever time met we ever you met, years yeah. ago, two, three years ago, four years ago. And she was wearing this little Wonder Woman necklace that size yeah. <laughs> or maybe a tiny bit bigger than what, that one. And I was like, Lisa, I, I love that necklace. And so Lisa took off the necklace mm. and handed it to me just gave it to me and I put it around my neck. I never took it off. And in that moment, I needed it so much because I was going through something. I don't remember exactly, I can't recall. But in that moment, you gave me that necklace and it like basically gave me that alter ego, that, Mm -hmm. that, that Wonder Woman effect. And from that moment, I paid it forward. And when someone else was feeling down or they needed that extra push, I then went and got them that necklace and it like started this whole like trickle down effect. And then I go and get this. Dude, wonder- I know. You walk in and I'm like, oh shit, I gotta, you just one up to me, homie. Fucking what? impressive. Right? Respect, man. Right? The respect. But I feel when I wear this necklace like you do, it kind of gives you that feeling of like, I can conquer this world. Mm. I'm powerful. I'm strong. Yeah. And you know, whatever little tricks and tips that you can use to help you motivate to kind of go and, and go after that thing, use them because they all are very, very useful. What up, homie? I've got something free and new to share with you right now. How often are you visited by that negative voice in your head telling you that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, experienced enough, not fill in the blank? One of the most powerful things you can learn to do in life is to turn that negative voice into your bestie. And I wanna teach you how to do that and so much more in my four steps to becoming confident workshop. And guys, the most amazing thing is you can actually register for completely free for this workshop. So click the link on your screen and I'll see you on the inside. Yeah, and um, I love this story. I obviously didn't expect that you wrote it in your book, so it was so wonderful to read. But then the power of it really is amazing. And, you know, your podcast, Habits and Hustle, like the habit part of it is so damn important because that was, for me, the the thing that got me started. I was like, I was so petrified. I was like really insecure. I had to go on stage, do this TEDx. I was like, I don't know what I'm freaking doing. Right. So let me create a habit that can encourage me to keep going. That was like the idea, right? Because, and we should definitely actually talk about the power of habit because that is the thing that then allowed me to go, okay, I don't have the habit yet. I know it's powerful, but every time I look in the mirror, I need to believe that I can do this. How the hell do I do that? And I'm like, all right, I look in the mirror. What do I see from the head to the waist? Right. And I'm like, all right, necklace, Wonder Woman, great. So every time I would put it on, I would repeat to myself, you're badass like Wonder Woman. So that eventually now it just becomes natural inclination that when I put it on, I'm like, yeah, you know. Exactly. Um, And so the power of that, being able to call it like the Batman effect, obviously I'm a massive fan of Batman as well. Um, Catwoman, all the superheroes. So having a name that you know in certain moments where you need to show up and you're not able to is so damn powerful by calling it like the Batman effect. And then the study that you list is so damn powerful. I didn't even realize there was a study about it. Yeah. Of course, of course, 
there is. Um, and so there's another effect that I actually love called the George Costanza effect. Costanza. George Costanza. Let me help you out there. So are you, uh, did you ever watch Seinfeld? I knew about it. I was more of a Friends fan. Oh, so I was a major Seinfeld fan, right? And there is this whole thing. Um, if you're a Seinfeld person or if you've ever watched Seinfeld, you know George Costanza is was the character on the show that was uh, kind of like the loser of the bunch, you know, like, and this is, it was how it was, it was casted. He was like this short, overweight, bald man who lived at home with his mom and couldn't get a job and couldn't date. And like, that was the character and nothing ever really worked out for him. And so one day him and Jerry were like sitting at a breakfast or whatever. And he says, you know what, Jerry? I'm going to do everything the opposite of what I would normally do. And he went out and did everything the opposite of what he would normally do and how he would normally answer someone or, 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 or kind of show up in the world. He went out. He got a job with the Yankees by doing the opposite. He got the dream girl. Remember, this is a TV show. He got the dream girl. He got this great apartment. Everything started to work out for him. And that's why we call it the George Costanza effect, because it's about doing things the opposite of how you would normally approach things. Because a lot of times we get stuck in a rut and we end up doing things the same way over and over again. And then we expect a different result which is kind of insanity, right? They say you do the same, to doing the same thing over and over again, expecting things to be different. That's what, that's what insanity is. So what if we reverse it and then take it to like everyday, day-to-day -day life, not on a TV show, and start approaching things and start approaching life differently than how you would normally do it and see how things start to change. So if you're somebody who uh, hates to go out and leave the house, maybe start going out once in a while. You know, if you're somebody who always says no, I don't know, like, thinks very myopically, uh, no, maybe start saying yes to the things that you would normally say no to. Be open. So the idea is to, again, like assess who you are, what you're doing, how you're doing it, what your habits are, and then start to change them and actually start to change them, like take two or three of them and really make a big difference and see how life opens up for you. And they actually call this the Costanza effect, this whole doing the opposite of what you normally do because the results are astounding. I love it. So I've never heard of it before. So I love reading <laughs> it in your book. Um, and then when I think about the psychology behind it, because I'm very much about like how to get it in my, my own way. And so thinking about as we're talking about habits, there are certain habits that we all have that maybe we don't realize is not leading us in the direction we want to go in or having the life we want or having the relationship we want or having the career we want. So I go, okay, how do we counteract that? Like, what do we do when we find ourselves in that place where we're not getting what we want? Okay, the habits we we may not realize we're doing how do we recognize it going back to the recognition thing in so that we can then flip the habit and change it and the opposite the constanza effect really hit me because i was like this is a great way for us all to assess what habits we have and don't realize it so taking right. literally your day and then if you say okay I'll take my calendar and i maybe people can't do a day but I'm going to, instead of going to the gym, I'm going to sit on my ass and do nothing, right? Yeah, like whatever, whatever it is, I'm going to sit on my ass and do nothing and just scroll through the television the first thing that I get up in the morning. Maybe I'm going to go for a walk. And now you're like, oh my God, I didn't realize going for a walk in the morning actually made me so excited about the day that now it's changed my feelings and my mood for the rest of the day. Yeah, well, there are more, I, I, I'm a big believer in morning routines for that really that for that one reason because I believe you got to set the tone for the rest of the day mm -hmm. and the rest of the things you do. So putting daily habits really front end like front end your like your your day with things that are going to make you more productive and actually go after the things that you want later on. And so to me, having having that morning routine is so crucial and putting exercise in there. People think of exercise as something just physicality, like, oh, okay, I, if you want to like have a nicer ass or do, do, do this, I'm going to vanity purposes. But really what it does is it, again, is the cognitive, uh, the cognitive uh, benefits of what happens. The, the amount of um, a much more focus you get, the uh, being much more alert, 
giving you the self-confidence to kind of crush the world. Energy begets energy. People think they don't have enough energy to do something. But if you front load that day with that, that workout, what you get from it is tenfold later on. Mm -hmm. So having healthy habits in the, in the beginning of your day in that morning really sets the tone and puts you in a, in a position to win. So I am a big, big believer in habits. And that's why the whole, my whole podcast is about habits and hustle, right? Like what habits do you do that helped you become on point to be the most productive you can be? So people have to self-assess and say, okay, I can, I can do that. And by the way, I'm not talking about having, you don't have to work out for two hours, an hour, but sweat, move your body because it also says something else. Like I made time for me. I'm doing something for me, which is what you want to be thinking. You can't give to anybody else or show up in any other way to anybody else if you don't first do something to set, show up for yourself. You know what I mean? Yeah. All right. So I want to, I have never, I don't think I've ever asked you what exactly is your morning routine because people, if you don't have one, people want a guide, right? Like, okay, well, how do I show up? What's the first thing I do? And You've been married for 11 years. You got kids. You got freaking, you know, your own fire business. You got so many different businesses that you started and sold and things like that. What knowing that because everyone's going to be like, yeah, but you've got the time. That's the thing that catches time. people, right? <laughs> but it's the the idea that they perceive that well, you've got the time, so it's easy for you to say. Now, what I want to make sure that we really talk about is exactly what you do, so that people can see it isn't that you have the time is that you make the time. And the reason it's important, or when people look at you now, this is how you show up every day because you make that time in the morning. So I'd actually love to know with kids, husband, business, how the hell do you make, uh, do you carve that time out? And then exactly what does that look like? Okay, so there are certain things that are non-negotiable. The working out for me is the non-negotiable because I know what's gonna, what it, what it will do for me in like the byproduct of what mm -hmm. happens with it, right? It's not about just the working out. Like even most of the time, I don't want to do it. <laughs> I'm not interested in doing it. And I always say to people, do it even if you don't want to because what the after effects are. So I have very little time. I do have two little kids um, and I'm present for my kids. I think a lot of times, mm. you know, people will say, oh, well, she farms it out. I don't farm it out. I have someone who helps me with my kids. But at the end of the day, I'm very present. So I've created the life where I can be very available and around for my kids. Um, so what I would say is this. I don't have a lot of time, and I'm not going to say, and I think it would be remiss and very, it would be disingenuous if I say everything is working in flow all the time because it's not. There's always one thing out of balance. Mm. And some things are some, sometimes one, thing's in, you know, what, one thing gets way more attention than something else but that's ebb, that ebbs and flow and that's actually the truth and I think that if people have to stop being hard on themselves about that because life happens you know people do have kids and a husband or other priorities and it's really hard to do everything but if you can have a couple non-negotiables that are for you it really helps level that playing field and makes you feel much better when you show up so for me, my really only non-negotiable is that working out piece. And what I what I do is I wake up earlier. I mean, so like I, I know what my issue is. If I wait too long, then it won't happen. It will just not happen. And then I will be miserable and everyone around me will be miserable. And so for me, you have to look at your situation and be like, okay, well, where, what are the habits that are going to be good for me? And then how can I make it work and adjust adjust my schedule accordingly. Mm. So for me, it's the working out. I, I, in the morning, I make my kids breakfast and I make them their lunch and then they go to school. And then by, by 748, they're out the door for school. And then I can work out, let's say between eight and 845. So I, that's my window. You know, if, if I have a meeting, a phone call or something else that comes up because life happens, I will then wake up that extra 45 minutes earlier to make sure it's done. So I w I'm constantly mm. like moving and adjusting it. And then like I, I create situations where I automate certain things. I don't think about, I, I have this whole thing in my book about this whole energy allocation theory, which is 
I am not somebody that knows much or is interested in clothing or makeup. I mean, I probably look like a total disaster right now because I don't no, even know how to put makeup joking? on. You look hot, huh? No, what I do is I wear this. I wear a tank top. And Looks jeans. Awesome. Thank You're you. You're matching. You got orange and orange. I like red. Right. Well, that's basically where it stops and starts, honey. Okay, <laughs> let's be real. Okay, I I know nothing about fashion. It's actually kind of sad and pathetic. But my point that I'm trying to make is, I don't. I I, I really kind of try to create a situation where my energy is allocated to the right places and on autopilot for things that are not important to me. So I typically wear the same clothes every day, if not. If I'm not wearing my gym clothes, I'm just wearing a tank top and jeans. So I don't think about it. I typically eat the same breakfast every single morning. So again, doesn't take my energy to think about what I'm eating, what I'm doing. I just eat the same thing, which I know is healthy and good for me. And that makes me feel good. That will put me on the right path for the rest of the day. Energy not wasted on that. Mm. So create these systems for yourself where you could be a winner and be productive. And so for me, those are the things like I don't think about what I wear. I don't think about, uh, you know, what I'm eating in the, in the morning. That saves up a lot of energy and brain time for other things that are necessary. So for me, having these systems, having these habits, having these rituals really streamline what you're trying to really focus on and win at mm -hmm. besides the minutia of life, right? And because my life is very fine, like I, then my kids come home. So I have to be super efficient within a very finite period of time work-wise so then I can dedicate other time to my kids and my family, right? What I really love is the way that you've broken it down very realistically, because that's the truth, right? It's yeah. like, I don't want people to think that, oh my God, you have it all together and from this time to this time every day. It's like the ebb and flow is the superpower. Like that's the thing that exactly. people need to focus on, but know what levers you're pulling, right? So it's like, you know, when you pull the exercise lever, you feel good about yourself. You know that if you don't pull it, you don't feel good. You're in a bad mood. It has a knock-on effect. If we can start to really just take inventory of ourselves, of how we show up and know these, like, these moments, we can then start to rearrange our calendar, our schedule, identify the important things like you said, whereas like, I know if I don't do it, I'm gonna end like this. So I have to, set, I set an alarm. Now here's the thing, for me, it's more actually important that I get my sleep than get woken up by an alarm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then work out. So I go, okay, in these moments, if I actually am feeling tired, I'm better off sleeping than not working out. But to your point of ebb and flowing, sometimes I know I actually need to work out to feel good. And so I'll set the alarm, but I know what the levers do to me. I know what has mm -hmm. the knock-on effect. And then it now allows me to take the control of how I show up every day and what principles and tools that I need to really go be bold that specific day. Absolutely, I, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. Reverse engineer your life you know, and your schedule. Look at something and say, okay, if I need to do this and this and this today, how could I make it so that I can also include this and this that are non-negotiables. And then you reverse engineer that and, in, and then you, you, you kind of fit it in where you can. Mm. Like, like this is like real life, you know, like I, I'm not, I don't have time, you know, people, I know meditation is a big thing, you know, like, oh, you know, I, I wake up and a lot of people say, I, I write in my journal and I do meditation and then I do this. I don't have time for all of that. I'm just being honest yeah, and real. I, I, I can't sit there and, and in this position for 15 minutes that I don't have because I'm driving my kids to school. So I figured out like my form of meditation is running on the treadmill. I get my best ideas when I'm running on the treadmill. I can zone out and think about other things. So I basically combined, combined two modalities <laughs> together or I realize what works for me and what doesn't work for me. So it's a lot of it is trial and error. You gotta try a lot of shit out there to see what works for you, what benefits you, and what kind of you can like, you know, you can just forget about Dismiss, it. Yeah. It's really about that whole three Fs, you know, farm it, fix it, forget it. I forgot about meditation because it's not something that really does anything for me truly. So I figured, I found another thing that does work for me. But people don't know what they don't know. And so if you don't go out there and try a ton of stuff, you just don't know what's really going to be your non-negotiables. Mm. And, you know, for me, people say to me a lot of times, like, what's the best exercise to do, right? What's the best workout? 
the best workout is the one that you're going to actually do. <laughs> yeah. Is the one that you like. Yeah, right? yeah. If I say to you, Lisa, you should go run long distances every day, but you really hate running. Oh, I do. Right? I hate running. Right. So then what's the point of saying it to you? You're not going to do it. You're not going to want to do it. You might be polite to me and be like, yeah, that's great. I want to go do it. And then never do it. I'm not a yoga person. As much as you say to me, Jenna, I love yoga. Yoga is the best thing in the world. I love it. Well, it doesn't work for me. Just because it works for me doesn't mean it's going to necessarily work for you, vice versa. That's why the only way you can kind of figure that out is to try a lot of stuff. I love that. Completely agree. Because I used to be the person that was running on the treadmill counting my calories. And then yeah, yeah, when, yeah. when I had health issues, I was like, well, screw that. It's just like wrecking me. Let me just try lifting this weight. And I was like, oh my God, I really love it. And now all I do is wait. Literally, my treadmill doesn't even work. I mean, I haven't gone on it for so long. And I wouldn't have known until I got it. And then just to echo the reason why we're really hammering this home is that became my sanctuary. That became my place in the morning, my form of meditation, where I was like, oh, this is what it feels like to to take time for yourself to um, really get yourself on that right path for the day and really like treat telling yourself the message that you're worth it is so important. Um, I didn't hear, your, I'm curious to know your answer though. So your kids are already at school. What do you say to your husband or is he already at work by the time you're working out? Because I really want to make sure that we identify the things where people get tripped up and as women, we're people pleasers. And so now if we have to tell our kids, hey, don't bother mommy while she's working out, it's very hard for women to do or to tell their husband husband, hey, you can't come to me. I'm not going to make you food. I'm not going to do anything because I'm working out. People get tripped up over just owning that this is me time and this is why I need it. So it's interesting you say that. I typically, I, I, I have something in my brain where I can't tell them, you know, screw off when I'm working <laughs> out. Uh, my husband, I can, it's okay. But I feel like kids, le kids learn from observe like observation than me just telling them they know it's important to me they actually appreciate that they they're what i'm showing them a lot of the time what i'm working out is like i'm taking health seriously that i'm moving my body a lot of times my kids work out with me we do little workouts mm -hmm. together so like i think that the message that they're that they're receiving is actually very positive but to your point my husband understands like it's a super a super important part of my life but me and my husband have a very, um, our understanding is like, I let him be him and he lets me be me. So I don't, I, I, I don't tell him what should be important. Like we have a very um, supportive relationship where he gets to do his own thing. I get to do my own thing. And he, it's understand it. Like it's understood what's important. So he supports it. So like he knows it's important to me for me to work out. So he makes it so it's easy for me to get that accomplished just as he travels a lot. So I have to be very accommodating to that. But again, it's about like knowing who you, who you are, knowing who you're, who you're having a relationship with and then trying to accommodate so you both can be happy in the situation, right? Because when you're in a situation where you feel very pressed down or repressed, that no good comes from that. Nobody's happy. Oh my God. There's so much here. And the thing that really touches me that you repeated multiple times was he knew it was important to me. And the reason why I really want to like focus on that is because I think a lot of time, and I'm just going to speak for myself when I was the stay at home wife and I wasn't happy. It was because I wasn't telling my husband that it, that I was unhappy. I wasn't telling my right. husband what I needed. I wasn't telling my husband what was important to me because I was the people pleaser because I wanted to show up for everyone else. And we have this weird belief that if we speak up, we're not going to be accepted, loved, and we're not going to get our validation. And the beautiful thing is, I think is what you're really echoing here is that in telling them, that now allows the communication to open up even more. It actually allows you guys to come together more because now you're supporting each other. And so I think the very first step that people need to think through is, is that, are they articulating that to their partner? Not are they being, like, are they, like, kind of tiptoeing? They're, like, throwing hints. And being like, cagey about right? it. Right, like, I felt really great when I worked out the other week. It's like, okay, that isn't a very bold statement in saying, working out in the morning is so important to me. I feel great about myself and I'd love for you to help me on this journey. 
right? Those are very different ways to approach it. And because you and your husband already know what that important mark is, it then allows you to do this thing that is very important to you so that it you can then show up to be bold in other areas of your life. And so when we're talking about right now, people really going after that life, it isn't just about the stepping into being bold. It's how you start to um, create the foundation of that so that you can be bold. And so by communicating to the partner, to the people in your life, what you need to me is the biggest and most important, boldest first step you have to take. 100, especially when you have relationships and you have kids and you have uh, husbands and wives and whatever else, 100%. We we can't read minds, you know what I mean? People think people can read minds and we can't. So that's why it is important to be direct. I think being direct is actually very important. Mm -hmm. And to say, this is what's really, these are what's, this this is what's important to me. This is really what I need to feel the best and feel good and then just show up in other areas of my life. What do you need? Mm -hmm. Right? So then it's like on the table and then you can figure it out and then you can create plans and systems. Again, it's all about these plans and systems that help support this, right? And not live in a vacuum, right? You can't be upset by someone else, but when you haven't voiced what it really is important to you, and then you're not even living that truth, right? Like if you're sitting there upset because you're not able to work out or you're not able to go do this or go do that, and you know, you're just basically miserable, I mean, how does anyone else in your group and your bolder directors or your husband or your wife support that Mm -hmm. if you're not, if you don't even know yourself? So first step is figuring out what it is you need to to show up and and be the best version of yourself, figuring that out, then implementing it. Mm -hmm. And by implementing and executing on it, which is really the, the same thing, is telling the people that live with you day in and day out, this is what I need to do. And then thirdly, figuring out a plan and a system to make it happen. And when those days don't happen, it's not as, as, as smooth, reverse engineer always to figure out how to make that happen. Mm. So I, 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 don't, I don't really believe that. I think anything is possible if you actually want it bad enough. That's what I really believe. I think that it's a, it, it can sound kind of trite, but the reality is like if you have an idea of what you want, you have the, again, agency to kind of figure out by reverse engineering how those things can happen. You're not going to be, you're not going to get from A to Z tomorrow, but you know what? You may get from A to maybe A to B, right? Like baby steps until it becomes very accumulative and then you get to that thing. But you have to work with people. You can't, nothing is, no, no success happens on your own. It takes teams, it takes people, it takes communication, it takes all these little other things that are in the details, right? And so use your voice to to make things happen in that way. Yeah, God, there's so much power in saying that and in saying, you know, look, one of the many things I fucking love about you from the get-go is you're very honest and upfront and say it how you really feel. And so saying like, If you're not actually taking action, is it that important to you, right? Like, what is that thing? Like, if you really want it bad, if you want it so damn badly, you will find a way. Now, that's not to say that it's going to be freaking easy or that you're a superwoman or anything like that. It just means that now you're going to be open to trying things, to restructuring your life so that you can get there. And so as we start to talk about, like you mentioned it earlier and I didn't want to interrupt you, but you were saying about time allocation, like where's your energy going, right? Even with something like that, where if you're one of these people that right now you feel very overwhelmed, you want to be there for everybody else, you want to show up for everyone, but you also want to show up for yourself. And now you're like really lost. You don't know where to go. You want it badly, but you're not taking action. Okay, no problem. But now take a step back and say, how do I actually start to take action. Where's my energy going? Like actually look at where your time and energy is going and then see if you're putting time and energy into things that actually don't matter. To your point, breakfast. Who bloody cares? Put that on an automated process and now you don't have to think about it. I love those very tactical tips that you laid out. And then the other thing that you talk about in your book is as you start to do this time allocation, the 80-20 rule. So talk to me about the 80-20 rule, where you put your energy, because I think this is super powerful on how we then actually make that shift from being stuck to then making a change. Okay, and I want to just mention something else about the energy allocation because everyone has different things that are important to them, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And the, the breakfast for me actually is something that's super important to me in the way that is 
I want to have something healthy that I feel like I'm starting my day off right. So I don't want to just have like a bowl of, uh, I don't know, make, make it up, right? Like Cereal. frosted flakes yes. or whatever it is, right? I want to make sure I'm having things healthy because then I feel good and then that will, I'll make better decisions for food later on. Mm. That's why I have the breakfast mm. every single day. And that's why I think it's important for a lot of people to do that. So if they, if they have breakfast. So- And then can I just add one more thing to yes. this? Actually, how do you make your breakfast? I, okay, so for me, okay, I've changed it over the last, uh, that's funny because I've been having the same thing for 20 years. And then recently I started to do something else. So I have two, op, one of two things. Either I have eggs, which is a crazy way of making these kooky eggs, which is I make them into a, like a pizza form, which is I, I scramble these eggs up, I put them in a pan, I let them cook, I put a little bit of cheese on it, I flip it over and put more cheese, a little bit more cheese. Or, by the way, why'd you ask me that question? Because I was wondering if your time allocation to how you eat is just as condensed as making sure that it's automated so you know what to eat. Very, uh, that's so clever. So that's when I have a few more minutes. So that's why I have these two options now because I didn't want to put a lot of energy right. into like, it. As you explain, I'm like, oh my God, that takes so much energy. Okay, right? Who's but got time for that? I don't. So that's what I'm saying. <laughs> the times when right. I can actually like have breakfast, like let's say on the weekend, whatever, I'll do this little flippity, flippity flip. Or what normally now happens is I make a shake. And in the shake, I would put a banana, spinach, some chocolate, whey, uh, some chocolate powder, uh, protein powder, and ice and almond milk. And that's my shake. Takes three minutes to make. I drink it as I go. There's no thought. I feel good about it. I feel good that I've had it. And, and then I'm off to the races because it takes such a little amount of time. I don't have much energy to put on that stuff. But some people who really love fashion, right? That could be their place where they, they need to put more energy because that's what they like and that's what they do. I would suggest like putting that stuff out the night before. So there's always ways around it. But I believe that our brain only has a certain amount of, of like capacity to mm -hmm. hold stuff and to really concentrate. And as the day goes through, like as the day goes on, your brain gets more fatigued, more tired. Mine does anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. So I want to have as much space and and um, energy for those things later on. So that's why I also believe in the morning. Do the hard stuff first. Get that stuff out of the way because it makes it much easier to do the rest of the stuff during the day. So anything that I have that's very difficult work wise, like an email I don't want to write, a call I don't want to do, something like that. I front load that. So I, that's the 20% yes. of the 80% of what you have to do. Yeah, absolutely. I front load everything into the morning stuff mm. because that's when I'm at, I'm at my peak. I'm at mm. my height of energy, focus, uh, cognitive ability. I feel the best because I already worked out. I have my confidence the most. But like as the day goes on, I'm going to get maybe hungry, cranky, tired. My kids are home yelling. And the, who knows, right? Life happens. I got to take my kids to this soccer game. Whatever it is, front load as much as you can for that stuff to happen. That is like another, another habit that is worked into my system to be the most successful and self-actualized as I want to be. It's so good. It's so good. I hope people really hear because what we're talking about, go these are the differences between the people that have the life they really want and the people that don't. They think we're crazy. Some people think we're crazy. Um, but I realize what you're saying is so damn true. I have to optimize my day completely. And so I don't judge myself. I just look at my day and go, where am I wasting time? Where can I actually get better at? So that I'm putting the energy towards the things I really need. And the reason why I asked you about your breakfast is I used to, so I have, because I've got a lot of gut issues, I always need to make sure that I've got like yeah. specific like chicken. So it's, you know, um, cage free chicken, all that type of thing. And so I have a chef that makes all my food and he freezes it. So I pull out of my freezer chicken, vegetables, and I normally cut it up, put it in a frying pan, I put some olive oil, <laughs> right? like, put some stir, and then I realized, oh my God, I've made this one meal that I need to set me, like you, I know that I have to set my day up with a nice healthy meal, that's how I'm gonna be very cog cognitively clear that day that I can make the decision, so I know the food is very important, but I've now taken this and I've added another 10 minutes to something that's already cooked, and so, when I go to how do I optimize my life? How do I actually go for the thing that I really want in life and have all the energy with all that I have to do? I don't have kids, but I have, you know, 52 people in our company. 
I really go, oh, where am I losing time? My breakfast. So now what I do is I've, I've pivoted because I realized I was wasting 10 minutes over here that I actually don't need to waste. I throw it in an air fryer, throw it in, close the door, put it on. I go take a shower. I come back from the shower. It's hot. And as I'm prepping for this episode, I have my plate next to me. I'm doing my little boards and I'm listening to the podcast of an interview that maybe you've done and I'm eating at the same time. And so now I found a way where I was losing 10 minutes while just standing there. And I found a way to not only remove that 10 minutes, but consolidate tasks. So now my energy is being like, uh, condensed, if you will, to this one little thing. Right. You're stacking them. Stacking. You're Thank sta you. <laughs> you're habit stacking, which is something I'm a big, big, I'm a big believer in habit stacking. And that's, I do that too. So I love now this red light. I don't know why. I just really like it. It's really good for your skin. It's good for inflammation, circulation. So I'm, I'm a, I can't just, it's, it's like a 10 minute or 50 minute thing, but I can't just stand there. And so what I do, similar to you, is I stack things that I have to do so I can do that at the same time mm -hmm. versus just like doing that then doing that. But it takes some, it takes some like planning and thought, right? But it's just like that little extra thing of reverse engineering. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to do all of these things. How can I do it in compartmental? Like, how do I compact them all together? And so what I do is like you, when you have your, when you, when you have your food from the air fryer, by the way, air fryer, a game, game changer, changer right? it, it, it takes the time, cuts it in half at, at minimum. And what I, that's the, that's the air fryer, but this light red light, I sit there, I listen to whatever pot, whatever podcast is coming up, like for research, I listen to the, the, the audible version of the book or an interview. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing two things at once. I'm sometimes even having my breakfast, like, like slurping my, my shake while I'm doing it. And it's 10 minutes. I'm doing all those things at the same time. So I'm stacking all of these things that have to be done and consolidating them so I can be like the most productive possible to optimize my life and my day. And I think when people are busy, you have to think like that, right? And like, I, it's not about, well, I'm too busy, I can't do that. It should be reframing and rephrasing that, saying I am really busy, but how do I make this work? How can I combine things where I can do this plus this at the same time? And it's about a different thought process. It's like thinking about things just a little bit differently. And it's not, it's not rocket science at all. It's just about like how reframing how you envision your life to be and what you want to do. Like 24 hours is, you could do a lot in 20, in, in like the time we have, if we just like, if we just kind of b just backtrack and create a plan. I love that. So like when I prepare for interviews now, before I come on set, I always take the shower and I have podcasts yeah. in my ears and I just put a shower cap over. I saw I'm, you did yeah, that. So I'm, smart. Well, dude, Cause I'm like, I'm wasting like eight minutes. Like I'm quick in the shower, yeah. but there's only so quick I can be like, you still got to wash. So I was like, okay, I lose eight minutes, but eight minutes before an episode is like, is the, is like the most time. Right. Like that's a, it's oh, fresh in your fresh. brain. So I was like, oh shit, what am I gonna, I was like, oh, headphones on, I was like, oh shit, no, they'll get wet. Oh, shower cap. So when you go to, it's not like I'm a genius. I just go, oh crap, I'm losing time here. Well, what can I do? I come up with a solution. I'm like, okay, that won't work because of the water on the headphones, they're not waterproof. And then I come up with another solution. And now I've realized this is a great way of optimizing. But what I wanna ask you is, do you have a fine line where you go, now my optimization is actually holding me back? So I don't really think I have a fine line. I think this is what it is. I think that we all have things that can kind of get in our way, right, of, of doing certain things. So I don't really feel that way yet. Do you feel that you do? So because of my health, as I was saying about my breakfast, right, like, oh, I'm cooking and I'm doing this, yeah. I'm prepping. I don't do that for my dinner. And I could, optimi dude, I could optimize my dinner to the yeah, end so degree. Yeah. But my health in just the seven years that I've been navigating how I yeah. show up and how I can actually stand, you know, I mean, I had massive health issues. I, I realized I need to at least have one meal in the day with peace. Mm -hmm. And so what I've done is I optimize my entire day and then I stop at five. I literally stop. I won't do phone calls. I'll switch off everything. And I just put on like a fun TV show. So I'll put on like Sex in the City or Friends. I deliberately do it. I tell people I won't contact them while I'm eating and I just, I literally sit there and just watch Friends. And then as soon as I'm done eating, I stop, I pause it when, as soon as I'm done, and then I go back to work. So for me, if I've got an episode like today, 
like yesterday, I actually was listening to um, part of your book. So I listened to it. I was listening to your book while I was cooking and I wasn't entertaining myself. But if I don't have a show the next day, I will just watch TV. I'll watch Friends in the background because I want to build up that calmness before I sit down and actually eat my meal. Yeah. Um, but again, I have to see if I've got time. So depending on if I've got an interview the next day, I either don't um, prep while I'm prepping my food or I do. But while I sit down, I literally sit down with my tray. Where right? do you Which, sit? Where? On the sofa. Okay, on the sofa. Yeah, I have to, because okay. if I'm at a dining table, there's an emotion behind being at a dining table like that's very official. So, I'm, so in fact, I get changed. I put on my comfy clothes. So I put on like yeah. PJs or something before I eat. So I really do create this like zen type space for when I have my dinner. Um, and then as soon as I'm done, I kind of make sure that I'm not just like rushing back. So I'm like, oh, if I've taken a breath, let me finish this scene, right? Let me, let me finish yeah. watching this joke or this thing or that, you know, Rachel or Ross are doing. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then I will put my food down. I then switch the TV back off. I open back up my laptop and then I go back to work. But that optimizes, like when I think about it, I have to keep coaching myself into saying you can, the best thing you can do right now is not optimize because you need your health. And so even where we talk about where your time, your energy goes to, knowing thyself is the biggest, most important thing because for so long, I wasn't listening to my body. I wasn't listening to um, how do I show up for myself? And that's where my health ends up, you know, really kind of going Crushing. going correct yeah. first of all knowing thyself is really should be the tagline right i think all of this is about knowing thyself knowing who you are mm -hmm. knowing what you want what you like what you don't like what's important to you what the rituals that you need to optimize because even if they're not at your level of optimization or my level or optimization there still has to be a level of optimization to get through the things to to be where you want to be because we all have even if we don't say it out loud, we have a goals and dreams that we've had for many, many years that if, you know, it, you know, we all think, well, if this was that way, I wish this, or I wish that who doesn't say those things. Right. And to make some of those things happen, you have to think you, you, you got to like, like know thyself to know what, how to make it possible and what to make possible. I love your story though, because I do the same thing. I have a lot of rituals built around my life to to do that for to to do that same stuff what i think is interesting about you is what happens then what time do you stop working do you ever stop working yeah so because of my health i try to leave myself at least an hour before bed so what time do you go to bed nine always at nine always at nine look always I'm never going to say that, but of course it's like, for instance, yesterday, my mum's in town. So it was like, I was hanging out with my mum. I realized the time. And so I got to bed at like 9.15, okay. but it's not. <laughs> you crazy. She's so crazy. 9.15. Wow. You're an animal, no, Lisa. No. <laughs> but going to night, know thyself. I know I want my hour in the morning to work out alone i know that i don't want to set an alarm so the way that i am able to do that is i just have to go to bed early and so when i don't go to bed early in that moment i acknowledge yeah. okay you're still not going to set an alarm so this means that you may not get to work out or actually lisa is working out more important to you than sleep tomorrow and then now it allows me to then make that decision but for me because i know that's my best optimization yeah. the way that I show up. I try to go to bed at nine, so I normally try to finish work by eight o'clock. But depending on what's going on, if I can finish at 7.30, then I will. I always remind myself you're never done because if you think of your journey as a lifelong journey, because I really do, I. I learned a very long time ago that if you set yourself up, like whether it's a body weight, I wanna be this weight, or I wanna fit into this, or I wanna make this much money, it isn't a drive enough to keep you going. Yeah. And so when I think I don't ever put like that pinpoint of like, I want to get here, it's a, it's a lifelong journey. In order to do that, I must be able to ebb and flow. Yeah. I must be able to say today I'm tired, I, how do I show up tomorrow? Or my mom's in town, I really wanna make sure that I spend time with my mom, but how do I stick to my habits? Like all of these are so kind of like linked and intertwined. Yeah. But typically I have the, the general rule book says that I finish work by eight, I would go to bed at nine. Right. You need to have flexibility within your very, your schedule yeah. and your routine, but that's a good outline 
for how things go. You well, know? girl, honestly, your book has been so damn amazing. I love that you lay out all the principles. We've gone over some of them today. Um, but where can people find you, find the book? Thank you, Lisa. Um, the, the book, you can find at any fine bookstore. You can go to Amazon even. You can go to Barnes & Noble, Target, wherever books are sold. Bigger, better, bolder. Bigger, better, bolder. They can also find me on, of course, Instagram, TikTok, The Real Jen Cohen, or my website. You know, all the usual all places. The usual. Yeah, Guys, guys, you've got to go check out this woman's book. It literally lists all the principles, even more than what we just discussed here. But I actually want to hear from you guys. Drop in the comments, what was the one principle that really hit you that you're going to implement right now to show up and crush the new year? Let us know. Follow her. Go buy the book. If you're not subscribed, click that subscribe button down there, guys. And if you're not following me, follow me at Lisa Billy. And of course, like always, guys, be the freaking hero of your own life. Yeah. Peace. If you want to know exactly what to do to feel confident, well, here are six things you can do right now to get that confidence and overcome those insecurities that you feel hold you back. Click here now, homie. And I wore a Taylor Gucci dress with Louboutin red bottom heels.